Good evening, and thank you all for joining us for the February 6, 2018 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission. Let us begin the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> As we come together for our county commission meeting this evening, we are just a few days away from the start of the 2018 Winter Olympics, which will be held in Pyeongchang, South Korea. Whether you are a fan of the Winter Olympic sports or not, <clears throat> Let us all take time to reflect on the purpose and the spirit of this historic gathering of talented and dedicated young people from across the world to, com to compete in their respective athletic fields while also promoting international cooperation and peaceful relations. In that same spirit, before we begin the business of our meeting this evening, let us have a moment of silence during which time people may offer a silent prayer or reflect on what we all can do as individuals to promote understanding and cooperation within our own diverse community here in Buncombe County. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. And also before we begin the meeting this evening, I would like to acknowledge that we have with us this evening Representative Brian Turner, one of Buncombe County's three representatives in the North Carolina House of Representatives. Representative Turner, thank you for your service to us in our state capitol, and thank you for being with us this evening. I would also like to um, give a few moments to uh, County Commissioner Robert Presley to make uh, an announcement. Um, I think it's coming up. Our newest member of Buncombe County residence, <laughs> born this morning, Aww. my granddaughter, Abri Rose Presley. And all, all this is, I'm just so proud, my fourth one. Is this one of the reasons why I want to be a county commissioner? Is this is the future and this is what I'm working for. And thank you all for allowing me to say that. Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. Presley. You just went on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and um, thank you for being with us. If you have a cell phone, please uh, mute it or turn it off. I'm going to read the uh, ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there an item on the agenda the outcome of which will have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Also, does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters that are voted on by the board this evening. Um, one item I neglected to mention when I reviewed the agenda is that following the discussion around board appointments, we will take public comment on any matter. So any, anyone may speak to the county commission um, at that time about any matters that have not been previously um, had a public comment session on them earlier in the meeting. And uh, you'll have three minutes to address the board at that time. Any public issues that are voted on by the board will also have a separate public comment period for them when we take those matters up. All right, um, let's move on to the consent agenda. And Commissioner Belcher requested that we get a little bit of additional information on the Article 46 schools cap uh, tax capital fund 
project ordinances related to AB Tech. So who could share some additional info with us on that Greg item? Greg Israel's here if he wants to come up. Greg, as you come up, uh, what's in the report is on the Elm building, so you uh, might just talk about what we're doing, what we're doing there on the Elm building. But for the public, for the public, it's in the consent agenda, and they can see all the detail. I just wanted to give them a little more information. Answer them. But as far as Elm goes, uh, we have $150,000 in that request, and that is to. Uh, take care of some water intrusion issues. We're sealing the fluted block, uh, doing some roof work, and trying to control the humidity in that building. And uh, if you've been in it, you know it has a certain odor. We're trying to overcome that and just dry it out, basically, to preserve it until a decision is made on what to do with the Elm building. The other uh, part of that capital request, originally uh, AB Tech brought you a budget of $1.5 million for a specific list of improvements to be made. It was handed to me and I took it out and I used a professional estimator and a design team and uh, we came back with a budget amount of $3.9 million. So that $2.4 million that's in there is requested, that is to uh, basically complete the list that was originally given to me. So. May I say something? I've, I've worked with Greg on this and, and uh, Robert Presley and, and uh, Al Whiteside. We've, as commissioners, been on the board. Greg's put a good deal together with us. And we have had, we've had three uh, trustees involved, uh, Marianne Rice, Joe Bromick, and uh, what's the other one I had? One more. What's the other one that I had? I can't think. Matt, Matt Kern. Matt Kern, right. We're going to try uh, it, all the commissioners. I, I want to tell all the commissioners that sometime first of next month, I want to try to get all of you together, plus all the trustees. Then Greg can, he, I've talked to him, and he can put something together that we all can see everything that's happened as far as what's going to happen at AB Tech. And, you know, uh, right now, what he has planned is, is pretty awesome. All of us don't know exactly what's going on, but I want everybody to understand that. that AB Tech's going to be brought up to a great standard, and that's what we're looking for with the quarter cent sales tax. Very good. That Anything was good, else? Greg. Thank you. And thank you, Greg. <coughs> All right. Well, thank you, and I, I appreciate the request to talk about it a little bit more. This is this is a, it's important to take care of the buildings we have. It's a lot of times we focus on the new buildings that we're working on, and they get a lot of attention, but. It's really important to take care of what we got, so yeah. really appreciate That's everyone's it. work um, to put this together. All right, any other questions about the consent agenda? If not, uh, we need a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion, a second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. All right, uh, next item is the uh, WNC Diversity Engagement Coalition. <coughs> Paulina, now's your chance. <laughs> thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Like, this is my, my crew of people. Yeah, I'm <laughs> so happy that everyone is here. Um, but my name is Paulina Mendez, and I am the new communications and community engagement coordinator for the county. So going in on week two, but for the past couple of years, I had the privilege of being the program coordinator for the WNC Diversity Engagement Coalition. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the WNC Diversity Engagement Coalition, we are a network of organizations dedicated to increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we bring people together to collectively support the professional development, engagement, and inclusion of multicultural people in our community. So I do want to extend my gratitude to all of you for investing in, in us and, in turn, investing in your employees uh, for the county. One of the ways that, one of the programs that we have is our eight week professional development series. And it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of um, relationship building and a lot of professional development. And I am so excited to report that out of all, 
all of the Buncombe County employees that participated in the program graduated. And I have some of the um, graduates with me today, so I'd like to take a moment to recognize everyone. We've got Alex McKnight, George Hanna, Renata Conyers, um, Michelle Nelson, Demeska Thompson, Eric Barnes, Michelle Warren, Nadine Walker, and Sheila Hardy. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am of all of them and um, how much they mean to me, but I do want to turn it over and let Alex and George say a few words. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I just wanted to take some time out to thank the commissioners, uh, Lisa Eby, Paula Mendez, everyone who was involved with this program. Uh, I think I speak for myself and my classmates when I say uh, this program has taught me many skills that I can use both in my professional life as well as uh, personal. Uh, it's also made me more valuable as a Buffalo County employee to better serve the citizens. The citizens and uh, also allowed us to create some some relationships with other Buncombe County employees and Buncombe County resources that we might not have ever created on our own. So I just wanted to say thank you again. Thank you, George. <laughs> I'm George Hanna, and like Alex said, I thank you for giving us this opportunity. It was a special opportunity. Uh, we formed a sort of friendship it was almost like a team building exercise that I'm not sure it was meant to be that you know it was more to teach us the diversity and we Alex and I've become friends since then Eric and I've become friends since then and I think all the rest of us you know we we sat in the the room and we talked about these in the class we called them uncomfortable conversations because we were talking about diversity but when I sat down and thought about it they were actually comfortable conversations in an uncomfortable topic I guess is to me a better way to say it because I was comfortable with everyone that I was talking to it, it we kind of built built up to it maybe throughout the classes would, would everyone agree and maybe unintentionally or maybe it was intentional maybe Paulina did this on purpose <laughs> I don't know. Um, but we we got to a place and it was easy to talk about these things that most people don't want to talk about because they they're taboo or they're whatever the case may be and doing these classes helped us get to that point and we talked about things that I think we can bring back to the county and make us better employees uh, but I also met department employees that I never would have met otherwise usually I'm an IT guy so I'm usually going in and fixing things and then getting out of the room and and that's that's not establishing relationships that's just putting out a fire and moving on to the next fire so these are folks that I'll be able to next time I go to their desk we'll be able to have a conversation about friends and family and what's going on in your life and I think that'll help us carry on as better employees as we go forward and I'm gonna meet new people through them that they know better in their departments and they'll do the same thing with IT and I think we'll also look at each other differently doesn't matter what color we are doesn't matter what gender we are it doesn't it, none of those things matter we're here as a team and I think that's what this class brought us together to do so and that's it Thank you. Hey, thanks so much. Congratulations to all of you. <clears throat> all right. The next item on our agenda is a public hearing to consider a resolution regarding capital costs of school improvements and extension of deed of trust. And Tim Flora will kick it off. Thank you, Chairman Newman, Vice Chair, Commissioners. Uh, tonight, we are, is the, if we can get that presentation up, there we go. Um, let me get, so tonight we're gonna begin the process of financing um, some school capital projects that you as a board have approved over the last three years. Um, these are projects um, that have been recommended by the School Capital Fund Commission as part of the Article 39 um, uh, sales tax revenue financing or uh, sales tax revenue projects that we have going out here. You have been you have approved projects uh, since 2016 um, to the and um, 
2016, 2017, and 2018, and you've approved the funding for these projects, and we have been successfully, successfully have been able to use uh, cash flow from that fund to pay for these projects, but we've gotten to the point where it's now time um, to um, go out to the markets uh, to finance these projects, um, and so we stretch that cash flow as, long, as far as we could. It has always been the plan since the beginning of uh, this process that in order to stretch those dollars to, to meet all the capital needs of this, the, the local schools that, that we were going to have to finance these projects. And so tonight is sort of the beginning of that process. And so with me um, tonight, um, I have uh, Ty Welford, who is a senior vice president with Daven Davenport. They are um, our financial advisors that the, the county has used for the last couple of years and people that we have relied upon to help us work through this process to make sure that um, our processes and procedures are as they should be and that we are making good solid financial decisions um, and how we are moving forward with um, managing um, the cash flows and the funds from this fund. Um, the issuance that we're, we'll be going at, we're going out to the capital market and so the projects that we will be funding are about $60 million worth of, again, previously approved projects. And so here's just sort of a summary of some of the bigger projects. Uh, it's the Has Asheville High project that, that, that we've talked to you many times before about, the Community High School, uh, the Montfort North Star Academy project, and then sort of a sundry of other projects, uh, LED um, replacements, some sustainability projects, and then roofing um, and other uh, sundry projects. And so, um, Ty is going to sort of walk you through the process to help you, give you and the public sort of a better understanding of, of how all the, all the different working components of this, and then we will be available to uh, answer any questions that you might have following uh, his uh, presentation. Make sure I have this down. Okay. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to the uh, commission for letting me be here today. Um, as Tim said, my colleagues and I have been working with the county for the past couple years uh, and really focused in in the past year looking at uh, capital projects and uh, specifically on these school projects, making sure um, we had our ducks in a row, uh, we had the planning process in place to go to the market and issue bonds to, to fund the projects that we're ready to spend. Um, I'm gonna give an overview of the process we're gonna go through, the schedule, um, certainly would welcome any questions as we go through it. Uh, on page three here, some of the key items uh, for the anticipated sale. Uh, we are anticipating issuing limited obligation bonds, which has been the county's historic method of issuing debt in the public markets. Uh, the, the specifics are that uh, we will be issuing under the county's 2015 deed of trust which was created to uh, sell the 2015 limited obligation bonds. We are adding additional collateral to that package uh, since we'll be adding debt to finance these projects. Uh, the specific collateral here will be the Montford North Star Academy and the Asheville High School. Um, the, some of the key details of the issuance are listed in the next bullet. Uh, we are issuing via public sale, and I'll spend a minute talking about that on the next slide. Our issuance date is pegged for March of 2018. We'll be pricing in mid-March and closing by the end of March, which is when the funds will be available. The term of our uh, issuance is 20 years. We've provided on the right-hand side of this slide an estimated amortization of the principal amount of the bonds we'll be issuing. This is just an estimate. It'll move uh, all the way up until we lock in our rates in mid-March. Um, I will note that the estimated par amount here of 54.555 million is less than the project amount. That does not mean we're gonna be getting less money than we need. It's purely a function of the public markets and our current estimates assume we would be getting a slight premium for selling those bonds based off of investor preferences. So we will get the 60 million we need, we will be issuing a lesser par amount in order to accomplish that. And finally, on this uh, bottom left-hand corner of the slide, we've listed the uh, financing participants. Uh, we're working as the financial advisor, Bond Council Parker Poe will be uh, covering the legal documents and legal approvals. Um, I should note, which we'll cover in a minute as well, but <coughs> tonight's really the first step in the process, the public hearing 
the February 20th meeting that you all have will be the real action from the county board standpoint of approving the financing. So it's a two-step process um, in this approach. The underwriting team will be led by R.W. Baird. Um, Wells Fargo will be co-manager. Their counsel, McGuire Woods, and trustee, Regions Bank. Just spend a minute about uh, method of sale considerations, uh, the two major um, avenues that were analyzed for this financing were a public offering versus a bank loan. And certainly there is um, a place for both methods. Uh, in this case, for what we are anticipating issuing, uh, the key determining factors that steer us towards a public sale are really the size, the term, the collateral structure, and then lastly, the interest rate the interest rate is kind of based off of these other factors. Uh, the size, I'll just note, you know, we're going to be in the 50 to $60 million issuance range. Certainly, it can be difficult to get that amount of funding from a single bank. Uh, they tend to like smaller amounts. It's not to say that uh, there isn't a bank willing to do that, but it's a smaller universe of banks that would be willing to fund that size of a loan. The term, we're looking for a 20-year fixed rate, once again. Um, there are banks willing to go out 20 years with a fixed rate. Uh, it's a smaller universe of banks, so it's not as good a fit with what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, the collateral we talked about a little bit. We're, doing, we're utilizing a collateral package, which works well in the public markets. Banks tend to like a single uh, piece of collateral, and they don't like sharing collateral typically. And then the interest rate, um, I'll just note we've had some very recent similar uh, type of financings that we've reached out to our broad universe of banks, uh, state, national, and regional banks, and based off of what we've seen for a 20-year fixed rate of uh, project amount this size, the bank rates just have not been as um, efficient as the public market. Uh, the two data points we've seen in the last month, the bank, the best bank rates we've seen one was 50 basis points worse than the public market estimate. The other was 100 basis points. And just to put that in perspective, with this loan, um, that would translate into, depending 50 to 100 basis points, somewhere to the tune of 2.7 million to about 5 point, or 2.8 to about 5.6 million of total additional payments you'd be making um, with that sort of a markup. So. These factors have all steered us towards um, the public sale, which we feel pretty strongly will give us the best result. This next slide is really just for informational purposes. I just wanted to note the county was upgraded to AAA by Moody's in the winter of 2016. Uh, so you now have AAA ratings from both Moody's and S&P. Uh, some folks like to ask, well, what's the benefit of that AAA? We've put some information together on this slide. Um, the answer is it's a moving target. It depends on the market that day. But certainly since the financial crisis in 2008, investors have put a premium on credit quality. And so the difference between, say, a AAA and a AA credit rating, the average spread there has been 23 basis points since 2008. And so like I talked about on the previous slide, that would translate 10 basis points is about 570,000 of additional payments. 20 basis points is double that. So just trying to give you a little bit of a framework there for uh, the benefit of having that AAA rating. And then lastly, a summary schedule here uh, that Tim alluded to. Uh, one key step in the debt issuance process in North Carolina that I know you all are familiar with is the local government commission has to approve any debt financing uh, certainly of this magnitude, and that is a process that we've already started. It, it runs a parallel track <coughs> with you all's approval process. Um, we submitted an application to the LGC uh, at the beginning of this month. We had a discussion with them. Um, based off LGC staff, they've given us the go-ahead to proceed. LGC is meeting on March 6th to consider approval of this financing. So the key steps we have is the public hearing today, the approval on February 20th, the LGC approval on March 6th, 
Uh, we'll be getting credit ratings along the process, and all of that will come together to allow us to access the public markets uh, in mid-March and close on the financing by the end of March. So happy to entertain any questions that you might have. So I've just got a co just a comment. Um, so there are a couple of reasons why, and you said this and I'm repeating. I guess some of, some of what you said just to to nail it down. When you go to the when you go to the public market, these are very good performing loans. So investors want them, right? That's correct. There's so because the risk is lower, then the interest rate that the taxpayer is paying is less. That's correct. And so because they are uh, large in scale, 60 million, we're not able to reach out to the local banks for those. But on lower amounts, we may be able to, and they, you know, m may be at just as competitive as a public market. But in this size of a uh, of a um, of an offering, you know, we have to go to the <coughs> public market. But I also want to say that the detail on this is is very good, Tim, and I, I appreciate the bringing in the extra help to explain it. It does it does help quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. And I have one thing to say. It's not really a question. What what you're speaking about is Article 36 money. That's money that comes out of our seven cents sales tax, and then it's not any more tied into our property tax. Some people right. This think, is Article 39 sales tax, right. and by okay. by law, it is it is specific to school capital funding, and so that flows through the school capital fund commission, which then makes the recommendations based upon need from the two school systems to you, the county commissioners. And then you ultimately approve <coughs> the projects that are re recommended to you. But yes, it is a dedicated revenue stream. It is outside of the general fund. It's a, it's its own specific fund. Correct. Um, I have one question. Could you say just a little bit more, uh, go into a little bit more detail about what collateral and security the county offers as a, for the, for the loan repayment? Sure. The, the um, bond repayment. So the the structure of this financing is not too dissimilar from a mortgage, your home mortgage, where when you go to take a loan, you have the collateral to support the loan. And you need to have a certain level of collateral to get a certain dollar amount in your loan. Um, in this stance, and it's fairly common in, in the public markets, um, there's a package of collateral and we th that, that is already existing that was created in 2015 when that financing was done. And so the collateral uh, was sufficient to support the financing at that time. Given we are borrowing more um, and it's efficient to do it under the same package, we need to add some additional collateral to that so that the, um, th th they, the ratio makes sense. And, and I'll note, uh, specific in North Carolina especially, you can't just pledge any collateral. Uh, you need to be financing improvements to that in order to uh, pledge it. And so in this case, we're doing fairly substantial improvements to Asheville High and to Montford. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons it's- So it's the, it's the real estate on which the buildings sit that we're, that we're making the improvements to, or building new buildings on. It's, it's that specific real estate. It's, it, it is, the buildings are already there. You're enhancing it or modifying, improving those facilities. Okay, so it's just the, the collateral is real estate. Is, is the Article 39 revenue also collateral? The revenue is not. Um, that is how you all specifically pay for it and you've identified it for your budgetary purposes. The, you effectively have a promise to pay the debt service associated with the bonds. It's, it's called a subject to appropriation pledge and I'm, I'm not a lawyer so I, I'm not going to portray that I know all the specifics but you are um, obligated to put it in your budget every year and to determine if you know those payments are made as part of the budget process every year. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, we're not going to vote on this this evening, but we're going to have a public hearing. So I'd like to go ahead and open the public hearing at um, 533. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment during the public hearing? Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Glad you got to see me again. Yeah, me too. It's 
smile. I mean, it's a good time. <laughs> You're talking about money. Uh, Wells Fargo, I heard mentioned. They've been in the news more than any bank I know of for things that are not appropriate. So make sure you check into that. Whatever it is that they got their name on, you make sure that you're checking that out. Uh, Article 39 sales tax. Hey, it's been around here in Buncombe County for years. It's the only one in the state that's designated <coughs> for this kind of money. And uh, I think we have used it to the guilt, and we need to be going the other way, you know. Uh, we used to be the dilapidated dozen. Now we're the uh, 40, almost 50 buildings in Buncombe County and the city of Asheville. Now, that look like mansions, not dilapidated. So there's a piece here that you need to hear. This is not just about brick and mortar. We have done this for 20 years, brick and mortar. The education of our children are suffering. They're having to go out into charter schools and other parochial schools <coughs> and other home schools to get an education. So I'm bringing this point up because education is supposed to be one of the priority things, and brick and mortar should be secondary to that. Buncombe County's got enough brick and mortar. We need to educate. Now, uh, the bond rating, I don't know why we're up here talking about bond rating. My gosh, we're proficient in getting money. Uh, the sales tax, if it goes down on Article 39 for a if it come to a bad time, where are we going to get our money to pay that bill? Is it going to be out of property tax? So that would be a question I'd like to ask. Would sales tax it go to revert to it if the sales tax wasn't there to pay that bill? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right. Uh, close the public hearing at 5.35. And... Um, do you have a comment, uh, Chairman? Sure. Uh, just to the point on the question about sales tax, it probably wouldn't be bad at some point in time to just have a historical information on sales tax to show, you know, through recessionary periods and such, you know, what it, what it looks like, you know, and the growth. Uh, and it wouldn't be a bad thing to have in the future at some point in time. And I will speak to that because actually uh, next Monday is our next school school capital fund commission meeting, and that is actually something we will be looking at is um, – modeling um, that same modeling through a recession to see what what that would what impact that would have on our, our financing yeah I think it'd just be good to you know at some point in a commission meeting just to show the historical data on uh, on sales tax sure it's also yeah. scheduled for your work session next there week. you go <laughs> okay. way right. ahead of me thank, thank you. you all right and, and then the other question that um, that was asked is so <laughs> so the plan is to repay this using the article 39 funding but what if the funds were not sufficient to do that the county is committing to repay these funds so we would drop on other uh financial resources i in think the we event would be to, we uh, would be obligated to yes but i i think really what what we're doing in this situation is um we have been using fund balance out of that fund um to cash flow this now we're going to once, once we do this financing <coughs> we're going to re re reimburse ourselves the money that we've been using from the reserve so there will be there will always be a cushion now you know the so if the economy takes you know a downward turn um, i think we we were able to sustain ourselves um, mm -hmm. through those issues now what it what it may impact would be future decisions that the school capital fund commission may make on future right. projects right. but i think probably as 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 long as far as the existing um projects that we have already funded i think we would be um secure in, in maintaining those those payments so we would look to the general fund to the fund balance during those the well no um, we what what pro the likelihood would happen is that um, we would cut back on the amount of projects that we would award in the future um, I really think that the way we have been modeling it and what, what we're looking at is that the, the fund itself the school capital commission fund itself would be able to okay. um, sustain any any hits in the economy in the in the foreseeable future right. yes. just during if we were if we went into a bad recession during that period we may not be able to take on new projects because right. we would yes. need the revenue yes. to focus on paying down the debt got it was it um in 2009 that was a great recession how was it affected 
So in 2009, um, we didn't have the setup that we have now with the School Capital Fund Commission. It was just funds were allocated um, right. by average daily membership to the, to the different schools. And so it, it was done in a completely different um, But process. the sales tax was still maintained. The sales tax was maintained, yeah. but um, um, the schools had better con the, the schools had control of the projects that they were. Right, um, but the, the income from the sales tax didn't go down because of. I mean, they were still able oh, to carry. Oh, I on. see what you're saying. Um, I it we would have to look. I mean, we did take it. We we did take a hit. Um, it wasn't significant, but we did take a hit on. It's part the sales of the historical revenues. data that's you'll right. see Tuesday, right. but I will say, and that's a policy decision that you'll be revisiting Tuesday, we're very conservative in estimating growth in sales tax for some of those reasons, too. Thanks. The, the talking about bringing the money back in, the money that you've spent, how much do you think that we, I, I, I guess it's just money basically set aside. If we did have a problem, what kind of money are you talking about, Tim? I would say that probably, I, gosh, I would have to go back and look, but I mean, it, it, it would be, you know, probably $15, $20 million that we would have. Um, because Seriously. we get, I think that fund generates about 18 or $19 million a year in revenue that we have coming in. So, I mean, there's, there's constantly revenue flowing into that, um, right. into that uh, fund as well. So, so. But what you're talking, what we're borrowing and what you can put back to, to hold back, you're, you're going to have that set aside yes. if something did happen yes so that that gives us a little leverage okay yes. thank you all right great thanks everyone all right no vote required on this so i think we're ready to move on to the next item <coughs> which is the county manager's report mandy stone So Chairman and Commissioners and Representative Turner can speak to this. North Carolina has a relatively unique relationship under, under general statute with their counties where counties actually are arms of the state and deliver specific services on behalf of the state and one of those is public health. And I do want to note that while most of the services provided in public health are mandated or framed essential under the law, I more want to say what an significant impact they have on each and every one of our lives every day and I asked Dr. Mullendor who is our community's medical director to speak to some of those um, th some of the give you a status report around public health services and also asked Fletch Tove to come who is both your veteran services director but also your preparedness director who's responsible for ensuring as a community we're prepared for both man-made um, and natural disasters so I will note Stoney Blevins is here, your HHS director. All right, thank you, Mandy. Um, so like she said, my name is Jennifer Mullendorm, I'm the medical director for Buncombe County Health and Human Services, and um, here to share a little bit about how public health is involved in uh, preventing and responding <laughs> to some of uh, the common winter um, illnesses. So, all right, here we go. So let's start with the illness that is probably at the top of everybody's mind, flu, right? So um, flu activity is, in North Carolina is uh, widespread um, and remained widespread for the week ending January 27th, which is the most recent week for which data is available. Um, and this season, the main strain of the virus that we're seeing circulate is influenza A, H3N2. And um, that is being seen in North Carolina as well as across the U.S. And when we see that strain, as public health officials, we get worried because that is one of the more severe strains we have. And, and during those seasons when H3N2 is uh, dominant, we see more severe illness, uh, more hospitalizations, and more deaths. And typically, the hardest hit are going to be our older adults, so 65 years of age and older, and our young children. Um, and so this is some data that has come from the state. Again, it's uh, flu cases are not reportable to local public health, but flu-associated deaths are. Uh, and then we share that information with the state, who then passes that up to the CDC. And so from the beginning of the flu season, which was October 1st of 2017, through uh, the week ending uh, January 27th, there were 95 total flu-associated deaths in North Carolina. Three of those were children. Uh, in the 5 to 17 years of age range, 
and 63 of those were older adults. Again, seeing that the impact of this uh, strain of flu tends to be on older adults. Uh, locally, as of today, in Buncombe County, we've had f eight flu-associated deaths. Um, all were in uh, adults 50 years of age and older. Um, and we're able to capture um, data that I, I think is more um, what I hear from providers, like were those people immunized? Did they have underlying health conditions? So I can speak to that for our, our residents. So five of those deaths um, occurred in people who were not immunized. And five of those deaths occurred in people who had underlying medical conditions. So again, we, we see um, the, the age puts you at higher risk, being an older adult, and then having an underlying um, health condition puts you uh, at risk. Last season, H3N2 was also the main strain that was circulating, and at the end of that flu season, there were 219 deaths in North Carolina, including seven children. Um, and over 150 of those deaths were in older adults. Uh, we had 13 deaths in Buncombe County last season. So we're kind of on track um, to have a repeat of last year. Um, and I, again, to get back at the immunization point, typical, typically in, in prior years, um, almost 85% of flu-associated deaths in children were in kids who were unvaccinated, which goes to, like, we're not using our number one tool in the fight against flu. We're not getting people immunized. Um, and so that is our number one goal in public health, right? Our, our number one goal is prevention. And so the one way, the number one way we do that is through encouraging immunization. Uh, at Buckham County Health and Human Services, we've given out over 1,600 flu shots uh, this season, which is comparable to where we were last year. Um, and then we communicate, uh, you know, uh, we are pushing messages out prior to flu season, during flu season to the public, uh, encouraging vaccination, and encourage the health habits to um, prevent contracting flu and prevent spread. Uh, I'm sharing information with local health care providers. Uh, about how to, you know, diagnose, how to how to manage flu cases. We get updates from the state on a regular basis, um, pushing that out. And then um, we work closely with residential health care facilities in the state of North Carolina. Uh, these facilities, so long-term care facilities, adult care homes, short-term rehab facilities, are required to report um, to local public health if they have two or more staff or residents who test positive for flu. That meets the definition of an outbreak of a flu in those facilities. And so our communicable disease nurses then uh, speak with typically the director of nursing or the infection prevention nurse at these facilities to assess the situation, to give them guidance on how to, how to control the outbreak in their facility. Um, but early reporting to the local public health is critical to enable us to kind of get in there quick, make guidance so that um, we can minimize uh, cases and hopefully prevent deaths. Um, and those communicable disease nurses are constantly, they're, they're checking in frequently with, with the facility, <coughs> making sure that things are getting under control or do they need additional guidance or support. Um, until that outbreak ends, they're following up with the facility. Um, so far this flu season, we've had seven flu outbreaks in this type of facilities. Um, uh, three occurred in December, four in January. Uh, last year, um, the flu season, we had nine flu outbreaks in facilities, including four in March. So I think people <coughs> tend to think like, oh, we're getting out of, the, out, of the, out of the flu season, but remember, flu season can go until May. So um, we're, we're hoping for our peak. We're not quite there yet, we don't think. Um, the other um, group that we really work closely with are our schools, so our school nurses, our child care facilities, and our child care consultants are very much our eyes and ears on the ground as well. They, they report to us about school absenteeism, um, if the, what they're seeing uh, in terms of symptoms in the students, um, so that we can um, uh, support schools in um, helping to control flu. We can get messages out to parents. Um, I saw. Uh, one of our staff took a picture the other day. Her child goes to a local child care, and there was our fact sheet in the parents' uh, folder to pick up. So uh, again, just trying to get messages out to people um, to promote uh, how to prevent flu and control it. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over now to, to Fletch to kind of talk about um, another thing that we do in order to get prepared for uh, potentially a flu pandemic. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to briefly discuss uh, how we would actually respond to an influenza pandemic, how we would push that mass prophylaxis out to a large percentage of the community in a short period of time, and what kind of actions would prompt that response from us. So we do that through our pod program, pod in this case being a point of dispensing. 
Those are predetermined locations geographically dispersed throughout the county where I can send a team, we'd set up a center of operations to push that mass prophylaxis at a high rate to members of the community. Um, essentially, that can be um, initiated through two ways. One at a local level, where we determine ourselves that our local medical facilities cannot meet the demands of the community, or down top down from a federal level, either from ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response, through Center for Disease Control, through activation of the Strategic National Stockpile, or through P Public Health Preparedness and Response. So um, how that works is we have seven locations determined throughout the community at our county and city high schools. Um, we have these, as you see in the picture, these deployable pod boxes that come equipped with equipment and supplies. So one of my response teams of 20 to 30 people can in a few hours set up this site at a cafeteria or a gymnasium and start pushing that prophylaxis. Um, in the case of a flu pandemic where we're doing vaccines, we determined that our rate about for an hour is about 300 people so one pod site in the course of 24 hours once it's up to speed we think we can vaccinate about 7,000 people um, and what this does for us this program is it helps us meet our public health preparedness core capability 8 which is medical countermeasure dispensing for the jurisdiction and this falls under our public health all hazards base plan so in this activation we're going to use uh, a couple of our annexes annexes some examples of those are the high cancer consequence pathogen plan our medical countermeasures plan and our pandemic flu plan. Uh, a couple weeks ago on January 26, we conducted our second annual full scale pod exercise in uh, partnership with the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy at UNCA. Uh, we had about 70 participants uh, that, that representing our county preparedness team, my pod managers, our county epidemiology team, school nurses, some of our clinic staff, as well as 20 students from the UNCA School of Pharmacy. We started the morning with a didactic portion. We reviewed uh, the history of pandemics. Uh, we're observing the 100 year anniversary of the Spanish flu this year. Uh, we talked about kind of how the flu itself shifts and drifts and migrates around the world. And then we had a deep dive into the operations of a pod. In the afternoon, we ran through several iterations of the pod vaccine scenario to maximize um, experience for everyone. Uh, it was a very successful day. We met our three goals, uh, the first of which was to familiarize the staff and students with what an emergency response would look like. Second, I was able to train my pod managers in the operations, setup, and logistics of a pod. And third of all, we were able to establish our baseline throughput for a vaccination style pod, which I mentioned earlier was about 300 people per hour with a minimally staffed pod. Uh, this model we use for the fl influenza is also, the same model we'd be pushing for any kind of public health emergency response, whether that's a uh, shelter in response to a winter storm, a radiological disaster, or perhaps even a chemical biological terrorist attack. It's the same model we'd be pushing out. So we're um, really happy with the way the exercise went. We're looking forward to continuing our partnership with UNCA into the future and maximize our uh, capacity. Thanks. All right, um, switching gears a little. Another common wintertime illness that public health addresses is norovirus, which may be called the stomach bug or incorrectly called the stomach flu. It's not the flu. Um, and so norovirus is really common between November and April. It's that acute abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting that comes on fast and goes away within one to three days. Um, and it is highly contagious and um, very um, hard to control because it can be resistant. It is resistant to many common disinfectants. Um, so uh, while alcohol-based hand sanitizer is great for most things, it does not work for norovirus. So hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Um, and um, because it is so contagious, it can easily rip through a childcare, a school, a, a long-term care facility. And as with flu, these um, residential health care facilities are required to report to us if they get uh, two or more staff or residents who have neuro-like uh, illness. We um, work with them. And, and this time, we will bring in often our environmental health staff who inspect these facilities. They are checking water temperature. They're checking the disinfectant strength that they're using to, again, try to control the outbreak. Um, and so uh, our environmental health staff and our communicable disease uh, nurses work in partnership to address norovirus. 
And then finally, what talk in Buncombe County would be complete without talking about pertussis? Uh, so although not specifically a winter illness, um, it, um, it's on everybody's mind because of the recent um, still ongoing Henderson County outbreak. Um, as of January 24th, there are up to 90 cases, thankfully seeing a downward trend, but um, not quite over yet. Um, and amazingly, we have um, not have any cases uh, associated with that outbreak. Um, we've only had four cases since their outbreak started, none of which were connected to the Henderson County outbreak. Um, um, and, but early on in the outbreak, what we did was notify our local health providers, making sure they are aware that there is an outbreak in our, in our surroundings, uh, sending um, information home to parents in schools where there was some coughing illness going around, saying if, if their kid has these symptoms, please get them to the doctor. Um, healthcare providers are required by state law to notify local public health when they have a suspected case of pertussis and um, our nurses jump on that, uh, conduct a very thorough investigation to determine does this person meet case definition for pertussis, make sure they were appropriately treated, appropriately treated and um, excluded from activities and then um, do a contact investigation because pertussis is so contagious, we need to make sure that all household contacts and any high risk close contacts get treated with medication to prevent their illness. Um, so um, I would say that uh, our, our communicable disease nurses, I, I think of them as like private investigators. They um, really are great at um, investigating things, getting to the bottom, and helping prevent spread. They work behind the scenes, um, which I think is one of those things public health often is sort of taken for granted because you don't always see what we do. Um, but we have really knowledgeable, dedicated staff who are out there every day um, trying to protect the uh, community's health. So thank you. And um, again, get vaccinated, wash your hands, and stay home when you're sick, which I think many of you have done. So I thank you for that. you all right next item uh, is the ambulance service <coughs> fee uh, and we have Jerry V Hahn with us to uh, explain the proposal hey, mr. chairman commissioners uh, I'm asking today for an increase in our ambulance rates, and I'll give you the, the reasoning behind the increase. The last time that uh, we had an increase was in 2011. And the reason that we haven't asked for one since, Medicare, who is the primary provider of reimbursement, uh, hadn't approved any more funding than what they did in 2011. They recently approved an increase, a big increase of 2%. <laughs> uh, anyway, that affects what all the insurance company does. It affects what Medicaid does as well as Medicare. And you have before you uh, what we're currently charging for different types of service that we provide, and, and we're asking to go up $100 across the board with the exception of mileage and mileage is going up uh, not a hundred not a hundred dollars but anyway mileage will be going from 875 per mile up to ten dollars per mile uh, one other thing that's that's going up and this came about after Medicare increased two percent as of the first of the year uh, where we go out and treat somebody but we don't transport them they decide that maybe they don't want to go to the hospital or it could be maybe from an overdose and we administer Narcan and they recover enough to where they're not going to, uh, uh, they're, they think they're going to be okay and we don't transport them. Previously, all we could collect was $200 for that and we may expand much more in medication. Some of these medications we carry on ambulance are rather expensive and a lot of times we don't even recoup our costs but here recently, like during the latter part of January, Blue Cross was 
kind of the leader, and they decided, well, they would go up to as much as $400 reimbursement for a treatment uh, before we didn't transport. So we're asking to go up to three, $375, and there's probably 5% of our calls that fall into that category. Oxygen use, you'll notice, is still the same $10. The reason for that, we can't collect any more than $10. If we did, we did. if we charge more, we'd have to write off more, and that's the same as the reason we haven't been going up since 2011. We billed out in FY 2017 just a little over $10 million, and during that period of time, we collected about $5 million. We collected on almost 70% of the calls that we made, but we only got about half the money, and that's due to the tremendous amount of write-offs for various reasons. And anyway, we're asking, since we did finally get a little increase from Medicare to where they will approve a little more, that we be allowed to go up uh, basically $100 per call, a little bit on mileage, and the treatment, no transport rate to go up. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Okay. How much were you uh, um, allowed to go up uh, from? Uh, we can go up any amount we want to. They don't say what it is. You just have to write more off because they only approve uh, increasing what they approve 2%. So they just increased 2%. They so. didn't, in, you know, so that's not a lot of increase. That's not a lot. Yeah. That'll give us roughly about $160,000 per year increase in revenue. Doing, doing it this way, Jerry, is just, <clears throat> they're going to go up anyway, right, whether you go up on the rate or not. You, yeah, uh, yeah. Medicare is going. They've already approved that two percent. Right. So they're going to go up anyway. They're so. going to go up anyway, and the billing company that we use is recommended, and a lot of other counties are doing the same thing. That we go up, increase our uh, rates a hundred dollars to try to recruit, recoup uh, some if, of the If costs. you leave it, if you leave your rate alone, that then it turns out that we'd show possibly less loss. Possibly. Yeah. I, I can understand going up at, at points, but, you know, if they're going up at 2%, then, you know, that's 2%, you know, 700 to 810 is probably a little more than that, but we'll end up showing more loss next year, possibly. Mm -hmm. So you're hoping by charging more, you're going to get more, basically. You're hoping it's going to stay at 50%. We're what? You're hoping it's good, the write off is going to remain about the same. Yeah. yeah, which means you'll get a you'll get a bump next year. And it may they may even go up more in this current calendar yeah. year. They go up on calendar years, not necessarily fiscal years. Okay. Can you just talk us through what the additional revenue would be used for, just so people can understand? It's be used to offset part of the cost for the service with uh, right. personnel cost or medic uh, medicine cost or supplies. You know, everything's gone up a pretty good amount since 2011. And, and the, the service will still, I mean, this will not make it a revenue neutral service. The county no. will still be subsidizing it, but just we'll still be subsidized. It would require less subsidy than if we leave it where it's at right now. Correct. Does this, the insurance companies, let me, let me say it's Blue Cross Blue Shield, do they pay quite a bit more than Medicare would? In a lot of cases, they do. So that's, Depending that's on what a kind benefit. of plan somebody has. Okay. But Medicare and Medicaid's locked in. So They're locked in. on. They, they tell us, they give us a chart, here's how much we'll pay for a certain type of call. Right, period. So don't matter if it's $1,000, you're just going to get X amount of dollars. Correct. Okay. And what about mileage, Jerry? What do they do on that? We charge mileage. They pay so much on mileage also, and that's the reason we're going up from uh, $10. 875 to $10. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Jerry, so everybody will understand if it's, and I, I need to understand too. Uh, if I'm a Medicare, you know, person, you, I called Amalance, it's $810. How much does the county get from that? We get approximately half of that. Okay. 
we'll collect across the board approximately 50% of what we actually bill by the time you have all of the write-offs. Okay. And just to be clear, nobody's ever denied a ride in the ambulance if they need it, just so we everybody... That's correct. You know, whether or not we collect anything or not, right. we, we transport everybody. Transport. How much, if we approve the change, how much additional um, revenue would it bring in that and thereby would offset that much subsidy? About $160,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. If we approve the, if we approve all the changes, correct. Okay. Do you know the percentage you pick up uh, every year that you don't collect anything? I mean, it's it stays pretty much the same. Fifty percent. It doesn't vary that much, but I can get you some figures and oh, that's the figure. go back and look at them for say five years or whatever you might okay. want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're uh, across the state. Where does this put us in line with counties our size? I don't know across the state, in the western part of the state, we're being in line with just about what everybody's charging. And that's pretty, it normally stays fairly close statewide, you know, but I'd have to look at it to, to be sure. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. <clears throat> Why don't we go ahead and um, take public comment and then we'll bring it back to the board. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Vihan. Um, we will open this up for public comment. Are there any members of the public who would like to <coughs> speak? 50%. Mr. Rice. That was my understanding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I find it just a little bit uh, concerning that the director here has said that it usually stays the same on the cost on the no-shows getting in the ambulance and coming to the hospital. If that's true, they've been a hype in this opioid thing to the point that it sounds like we've just run out of control with opioid pickups or not picking up. So if it stayed the same for five years or 10 years, why would we uh, be concerned about opioid pickups? Do you get what I'm saying? It must not be making any difference, in other words, on the picking up cost on the opioid side if it stayed the same for all these years <coughs> on the ones that don't pay or whatever. So it don't seem like there's a problem with uh, opioid pickups. Am I, am I reading this wrong? Hmm. That's amazing, ain't it? Now, the other piece of the money is I heard that the uh, hospital was putting in money on these ambulances at one point, uh, either operational or money for the medicine or something. So is that money being taken out, and how much is it, and how is that getting to be put back, and is that part of having to raise this money uh, up a little bit on all these services, too? All right, anyone else? Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hello, commissioners. Monica Christ from Chandler. Um, so I've been very, very busy since you guys have last seen me um, at the end of November. Shortly after that, I did a cleanup at the heart of Candler, as Mr. John Sutton calls it, uh, with two Inca High School girls. We cleaned up that whole corner. Everyone was complaining about it, and we went out and did something about it. We also posed a um, kind of a invitation to Candler, and above the graffiti, we wrote, this could be art. Now, since then, it's about two months later, the Shell Station, um, the station itself has no new graffiti. The whole graffiti that we challenged is now this beautiful piece of artwork. I don't know what it says, but it's pretty to look at more than it was before. And the trash buildup is at a minimal. This one random act with no funds and two high school girls made a positive impact. And it definitely changed a lot of people in Candler, just one evening. Now after that, you guys uh, opened up the Library Board of Trustees, which uh, I'll look it up that definition. 
basically what I'm summing up is the Library Board of Trustees is someone that you trust to uh, help handle the funds. You also awarded $300,000 to the Inca Candle Library. Why does no one know about this? This is an amazing thing to come to Inca Candler. And I'm excited. Just like at the opioid epidemic, that town hall that I went to, and I got to see all of you except Ms. Ferreira and Mr. Browning. Um, it's a beautiful thing coming to Candler, and more people need to know about it. And I know that there are a lot of applicants. But in my professional way of saying, gimme, gimme, please, 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 I know that you guys can trust me for that $300,000 to give resources to Candler. If I did it with no money, something the whole town was complaining about, imagine what myself and all these volunteers that are coming with me, the army behind me in Candler, imagine what good we can do for that. And I don't know if you know my original stance with all of it, it comes back to the opioid epidemic. It may sound like graffiti, it may sound like uh, resources or buses or this, that, and the third, but it all comes back to curbing the epi opioid epidemic. I know that you guys can trust me to give the respect to our community, to you guys to be, a, what was another one? I'm telling you, you guys do a lot around here, so much. I've been trying to follow. I've seen each of you commissioners at something different, whether it's a Democratic kickoff, which I was myself the first person to register to vote in 28 years, first time in 28 years in Buncombe County I was the first one because I finally found out what you guys do. <laughs> you make a difference. And as corny as it sounds and as politician as I may sound as my daddy calls me you know if we want to make a difference we have to vote we have to vote we have to get out there and I've been doing my best to spread the awareness spread the word you know um, everything that I could do to help curb it I hate that buzzer <laughs> thank you very much I would love questions please 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 <laughs> any questions I would we're be not, more than happy we're not gonna do that right now Thanks. okay <laughs> all right um, anybody else all right, bring it back to the board. Yes, Mr. Fryer. Else on yeah, uh, I don't think it doesn't sound like there are. Anybody else want to speak on the ambulance item? All right. All right, commissioners, we've got a motion and a second. Further discussion? Um, all right, um, I'll just make a comment. Um, you know, my only comment is, um, you know, I think I'm going to support the motion. My hope is that in the future we would maybe do, these are pretty pretty big increases, but, but on, on the other hand, we haven't done any since 2011. So my hope right. maybe going forward is we do kind of maybe more frequent but smaller. Um, anyway, it's just my comment, but I'll, I'll, support, I'll support the motion. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna comment since uh, the chair has too. I think you know I think that's <coughs> not a not a not a I'm gonna support it also. But that's not a bad idea. That you know as we look forward and everything we might you know want to uh, look out over the next five years or ten years you know at this and uh, and not have to catch up. You know just try to try to keep up with what we what we need. So. I think that's a really good suggestion. Um, I'd make the clarification that, like any other health care provider, we can only bill what the covered entities allowed us. Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross right. Blue Shield are the only things available. And to Mr. Rice's point, I don't think Mr. Vihan was saying we're not seeing more people. He's saying the percentage of uncovered individuals oh, yeah. remains the same. Right. Um, so Medicare has raised the rate, and if Buncombe doesn't raise the rate, it prevents us from asking Medicare to reimburse at the rate for that service that every other ambulance in the country now has the opportunity to do for those. Right. Um, but I would agree with you. Thank we you. were um, a little bit confused even how to bring a rate increase to you all around ambulance because we'd never seen one. So um, I hear your point, Chairman. Good point. Any anybody, uh, uh, Mr. Farr? Yeah. Uh, back to that, the rate. Uh, if if the rate is four hundred dollars, and they raise it to five hundred, then we go to eight hundred. We're still above the rate. Is it saying that if their rate was four hundred and was at five hundred, and they went to five hundred, would they? They'd still be paying us. They're not. We're not going out of that rate at all. 
Um, what is in front of you are the Medicare approved rates. They're not above the Medicare approved rates. No, we don't get the $800. But in, with any right, insurance claim, you're not going to you get the full them. amount because there are administrative fees. There are lot, you know, some claims that are denied. So um, you're never, I mean, that's typical to the delivery of the service that you're not going to get the full amount. Well, I understand that, but it is, is the question that I asked Jerry. If we didn't go up on the rates and we got to 2%, which is not a lot, then we would still be getting the same amount of money for the ambulance run. 2% would go up 2%. If you don't adopt the rate increase, Jerry can't charge Medicare the new rate. I agree with that one then. There you go. That's all I need to hear. <laughs> he should jump up if I'm wrong, but I think that's pretty clear. Thank you. All right. All right. All in Please favor, say. please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Vihan, for talking us through that issue. All right. Very good. All right. Thank you. Very good. All right. Uh, commission, uh, the next item are the board appointments. So let's um, walk through those. Um, We've got. Let's just let's just take them as they appear in our packet. Can we do that? Does everybody have that? Okay. Uh, the first one is the Historic Resources Commission. There's two vacancies. We have one. I'll applicant. nominate Valerie Watson. I'd second that if I needed to. All right. I don't think I all, in, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Then we've got the two Board of Adjustments. Um, Areas one is for the Asheville Board of Adjustments, and um, we have two applicants. We were talking earlier about whether to go ahead and make the decision on that this evening or to do interviews. So uh, let's just let's just um, majority rule here. I'd like to just kind of go through, and if you'd like to interview, let's let's say interview. If a majority already knows what you want to do, then we'll just vote. But uh, let's let's Inter just interview, and, and and I feel strongly about that because I don't know either of these people, and it's such okay. an important board. Okay. Commissioner Whiteside, what's your interview? Because one, I don't know. Okay. And I think only Pat will make the decision. Okay. Need to. Uh, I I would vote on those since there's only only two. Okay. I I'd prefer to interview. Uh, interview. Uh, vote. Vote. All right. It All sounds right. like so we're we'll interview. We'll, we'll, we'll interview those. Uh, All right. And um, then on the county board of vacancies, where there's a bigger pool of yeah, we'll vacancies, those. and there's um, uh, um, uh, our applicants, and there's two vacancies. So yeah. I think we're going to interview yeah. for those as well. Yes. All right. All right. Um, we have one vacancy on MSD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get up there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll nominate Jim Holland. I second. <laughs> all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you for serving on that <laughs> important board, Mr. Holland. I got my phone. All right. The, um, there's vacancies on the Adult Care Home Community Advisory Committee. There's seven vacancies. We've got two current applicants. I'll nominate Ron Nelson and Annie Minx and bless them for being willing to serve because we can never find people. It's hard. All right. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. I think that gets us through all of the boards we need to address this evening. Library board. Library. 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 Yeah, Library. Thank like you. Thank you. Thank you. Six pages. All right. So um, there's yeah. been some, there's been a proposal that uh, Mr. Holland would work. We have a big pool of applicants here, a lot of interest in the new library board. So there's been a suggestion that they work to uh, identify the geographic diversity of all the applicants and bring back kind of a smaller pool of uh, candidates which the board would then interview and make selections on, um, which would be geographically representative of our library system and the county. Um, and Mr. Holland emphasized that if there's any applicants that you, would, you really, really want to make sure we interview to let him know and, and in that way, those folks will definitely get an interview. So are folks comfortable with that?
process? Uh -huh. or it's just in light of how many applicants we have. And then maybe if how many are you thinking? We got I'm down sorry. to eight. We've got five five spots, right, that need to be filled. There's yeah. 26 total on this list, <laughs> which is really good. I mean, you yeah. know, we don't we usually don't get that kind of a response. So I don't know. I don't know the eights in it. I mean. There are several ways that you could do that if you wanted, because uh, the applicants, you have one from each district, and then you have two at large. You could uh, interview if you wanted by district. You could certainly do that and break that down. Uh, and uh, it's really up to your pleasure as to how, what's the most of the I have a worry. Um, I know, I know we're, we're we're here by districts, but I always worry on a commission level to um, be that specific to districts in the sense that we're all Buncombe County commissioners. Does that make sense? So I think if we could, you know, not, I mean, I can see representation from each district, but um, interview, get to a number and interview based on that. You know, like if you had at least two from every district and then sent them our way. I mean, just glancing, I, I think you could just about do three from each district. There's a lot of, and they're sp and they're spread out all over the county. Sure. We're talking about interviewing now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what we're talking about interviewing. So if they sort through the 26, and then, you know. So that would be nine, and then how many at large? Two. 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 Yeah, two at large. So if we did it that way, then you'd interview 12. Mm -hmm. Do three at large and three for Eleven. District. Well, we don't necessarily have to have more for the at-large because they can come from any of the districts. Right. So if we interviewed three from each district, we'd have nine people and each district get covered and then whoever else rises to the top would also get selected. Yeah. So I want to say like, you know, why don't we say like at least two or th three from each district and we're looking at somewhere between eight and ten, somewhere yeah. in that, yeah. somewhere in that range is kind of to shoot for that. And again, if there's anybody you really want to make sure we interview, just let let them know and we'll we'll interview them I think you had one come tonight and ask you probably you might want to interview her yes we did <laughs> sure okay sure we did. We did. Um, any other comments on this we, we everybody think this is a good we're gonna move forward so did we come up with a number eight to ten eight to ten mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah all right are you good mr. Holland absolutely okay thank all right. you Thank you, everyone. All right, the next item on our agenda is public comment. Um, and folks are welcome to come talk to us about any items that we, unless we've already uh, talked about it specifically <coughs> earlier in the meeting. Are there any folks who'd like to comment? Yes, sir. Come on up. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, Commissioners. My name is Michael Harney. And uh, I am a co-founder and operator of what we call the Needle Exchange Program of Asheville. It currently operates out of the office of the Western North Carolina AIDS Project. I also teach Spanish at AB Tech and at Blue Ridge Community College. So last week, uh, last Tuesday night, and some of you were not there, I hope you're feeling better, uh, Commissioner Belcher asked us to come to the three-minute uh, opportunity to speak before you and to maybe even educate you on some of the issues around the community. In uh, the early days of the needle exchange program, if we, we ever exchanged a thousand needles in a whole year, we thought we were pretty hot snot, to be honest. And uh, last year, went through about 418,000 needles, and the year before that, in 2016, we did 512,000 needles. So I brought a packet of information to you, uh, uh, Commissioner Belcher, and that's for your education. In it, you'll find a letter from the governor. We had. Um, the Deputy Secretary of Health and Services, Mark Benton, come in December and speak to us and listen to us and hear our concerns. The Western North Carolina AIDS Project serves an 18-county region, and yet we had people reporting coming from 32 counties and four states for access to clean needles. I am asking you to really consider becoming the model to the state of North Carolina. Early in the, uh, in the years when uh, Nathan Ramsey was the board chair and when George Bond was the health director, the health board, the Buncombe County Health Board, had a resolution in support of needle exchange. Asheville's been very supportive all over the years. And this has been a great location to be a model for our state. I'm hoping that you will consider tonight making some comments in support 
of actually operating needle exchange out of our county health department. I would like to see actually that all 85 county health departments across the state take this up. The needle exchange program of Asheville spent about $50,000. Um, supplying needles for all the counties and people that have come from these counties. So it's not that you would have to support that many people, but if we could spread this so that at least all 18 to 20 counties of Western North Carolina would have, uh, you know, maybe 5,000 needles or 10,000 needles or however many, it would really reduce the burden to us locally. It would keep people back home where they might not have to drive long distances to get the access. They could find access to uh, medical care, to safe disposal in the health department, maybe testing for HIV, hepatitis, maybe a counselor, all the things that may be available. I would like to hear tonight that you all, each of you support having the county health department operate needle exchange out of it and how we can work that out maybe with the medical director and other health directors in our community. I know Nancy, uh, um, Yancey County, uh, Diane Cook, I believe is her name, is the health director there is really looking into it. And there are other counties across the state doing the same. Um, I'm open to any questions that you have. I hope the packet will be of interest to you. It was um, House Bill 970 that legalized needle exchange in 2016 and House Bill 243 in 2017 amended the verbiage that no public funds could be used but no uh, state funds instead could not be used. That opens it up to county and city. So thank you very much. May I leave this for you, Commissioner? Uh, yes, sir. I'll leave it for you all can, of uh, you. Yeah, I'll leave it for everybody over uh, here. Or yeah. Jim or Kathy, yeah. either way. And thank you for, uh, thank you for the information. Yeah, and the invite, the invite was so you could provide information to us so that we could, you know, make decisions as we move, as we move forward. We won't be making any decisions tonight, but uh, again, I appreciate you coming and encourage everyone to come and <coughs> give us their comments. Get three, three minutes when you can, so. <laughs> All right, <coughs> thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public that would like to speak this evening? Um, okay. <laughs> well, we don't know what she's going to say. So. <laughs> Twice in one night, I feel special. Um, speaking on the uh, syringe exchange program, um, you know, unfortunately, at this day and age, we have to accept that syringes are out there. That's part of what I do. I personally train myself and the students that I go out with. It's, it's on the streets. It's everywhere. What this man speaks is the truth. <coughs> I've never personally chosen that route, but there are others who don't have that support structure. But what I will say, if you don't support wholly what this man has to say, then there definitely needs to be some, some give and take on spreading the awareness, spreading, spreading knowledge. <laughs> Mountain Energy uh, in Candler, Boone's Corner, I know Mr. Belcher, I know you know where that is. Well, that's my corner. Mountain Energy was my first job resource. I love those people. They give me apple strudels, you know. They are great people. Well, they have such a needle problem that they had to get the biohazard bins. Well, I go on there, check on my people, why is it that nobody knows who to get to come get these syringes? By nobody, I mean I personally got on the phone for over half an hour. I called the fire stations, I called APD, I called whomever I thought could help guide me to how we could get this full bin of syringes picked up and an empty one in its place because we are in the middle of an opioid epidemic, unfortunately. And the syringe exchange, that's who we need to contact and it, take it upon myself to go and spread that knowledge. It definitely is still a barrier between um, what we think people should do and what we want them to do. And I, I, have, I give you my 100% support because that's the day and age we unfortunately live in. But there has to be some give and take everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Rice? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the board. Okay, Jim Holland up here. I want to recognize him. He's on the Value Health Board, and he made a motion to do something. They accepted. How about that? That's getting unusual on the Value Health Board, by the way, Jim. We have to laugh about that one because he did a great job uh, opening up to uh, public. Um, I want to appreciate you all opening this thing up to an interview on this, uh, uh, these two candidates. I want to open your mind, if you don't know, that uh, the Inca partners in Inca on the ball field out there 
is one of the owners that you're looking at on uh, the interview, and his name is Bill Newman. He also served in 2006 on the planning board for the county, and he, him and his partners were the one that developed and all this property out there at the time that he is on the board. And there's a big article in Mountain Express about this. Why was the planning board overloaded with developers? This man should not be put on the board, in my opinion, because he's already served on board. We are re... We, there's a lot of good applicants out here. We don't have to repeat. They're in a big building project around Inca Lake and that place is out there with his kinds of business and his business. So uh, I think it'd be a conflict of interest in my opinion. So that's, that's that there. Now, the opioid crisis. I want you to focus on something. You need some really good help here with Bayou Health, maybe. I don't know whether they're the one good or not. But you got good staff to look in to what we call the substance abuse. Substance abuse has been a big issue with school kids for years. It's been swept under the rug. It's been not even funded or underfunded. And substance abuse is a big, big leader in where they're headed into opioid. Now, if you don't address the biggest issue with substance abuse, what do you think opioid is looking like? So I think the, the focus should be around the biggest population of people. Opioid is not the biggest population of people. Substance abuse is. That's what we heard from the doctor today downstairs. We've heard it all through these years about substance abuse. Now, uh, Value Health has never been funding the substance abuse. The state hasn't funded it, and we're not funding it. Let's talk about the biggest issue, substance abuse. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Colin Van Etten. I'm a resident of the Flat Creek area in North Buncombe County, and I'm also a Buncombe County employee. <coughs> Let's back up about three years in your mind. On March 9th, 2015, I relayed a concern to the Parks and Recreation Director showing that the county was in violation of state law regarding its ordinance on chapters 50-4 and 54-10 and the illegal posting of signage within county parks. Within four days of sending that email, I received a verbal and written reprimand from my manager followed by an emailed acknowledgement of such labeling my concern for the county's illegal posting of parks as, quote, the use of funds, supplies, or equipment of the county for political or partisan purposes. So let me just be really clear. Letting the county know that it is violating a law is neither political nor partisan. On October 3rd, as you well know, the county updated its personnel ordinance regarding retaliation. So on October 4th, I resubmitted that same request, quote, in an effort that the aforementioned ordinances and countywide signage be changed to bring the county back into legal compliance. I asked that the concerns originally brought forth in March of 2015 be addressed swiftly and appropriately. I'm willing and able to discuss this issue with whomever requests my presence or involvement in this matter. Well, that was four months ago on October 4th. Today we're at February 5th. So, February 5th today, letter to my manager. Please accept this letter as formal notice of my intent to resign from my position as communication specialist within Buncombe County Information Technology. My last day in this position will be Friday, February 9th, 2018. I had allowed enough time for this meeting to see if that was ever going to get on the agenda three years down the road. Decision was not an easy one, as I'm truly grateful that for the opportunity I've had to work within the IT department and serve the citizens of Buncombe County over the last three and a half years. Leaving behind the wonderful staff of BCIT will be difficult, as you're all terrific employees, and I'm certain your service to the county will continue henceforth. However, during my leave, I've found that the illegal county ordinances I first brought to the county administration in 2015 have yet to be corrected, 
and Buncombe County remains in blatant violation of state law to this day. As a Buncombe County employee paid by the citizens of this county and entrusted with the appropriate spending of our citizens' tax dollars, I can no longer sit by idly and be part of an organization that both refuses to comply with statutory law and rep reprimands its employees for bringing forth such concerns when it is in the administration's best interest to follow the law. If we, Buncombe County, require our citizens to follow established ordinances Your time and is laws, up. Your time is up. we should certainly hold ourselves to at Sir, least I'm the same Sir, I'm asking you standard. to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have any questions for the board, I'll gladly answer them. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right, public comment is over. There's no one else who wants to um, speak. Jerry's already spoken. Okay. All right, um, got a couple of announcements. On February 13th at 10 a.m., the Board of Commissioners will hold a special closed session to review direct report employees in room 326 at 200 College Street. On February 13th at 12.30 p.m., the Board of Commissioners will hold a workshop to discuss the FY19 budget in the first floor conference room at 200 College Street. On February 20th at 5 p.m. will be the next regular Board of Commission meeting in room 326 at 200 College Street in downtown Asheville. Is there any need for a closed session this evening? No, sir. Mr. Fru or Ms. Stone? All right. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, we're adjourned, thank you.